Welcome to Worship for November 8th, 2020. I am the Reverend Dr. Tara Paul, Senior Pastor here at Edmond Park United Methodist Church. If you happen to be watching this video on the 8th, let me remind you that today at 4 will be the fundraising concert at Sugar Magnolia Bed and Breakfast. Uh, music will be brought to us by Rick Gates, Jim Imshoff, and Dave Deckabach. Um, it's at 4 o'clock. You can watch it on Facebook Live or you can go to the uh, Bed and Breakfast yourself and bring a chair and socially distance. I'm um, going to take all the precautions necessary uh, to protect your Yourself and others. Also, as we uh, kind of making our way towards Advent, uh, just a r reminder or a heads up that on November 29th, we'll be doing an Advent wreath uh, sing fest via Zoom. Um, and Sarah has ordered all of the wreaths and there'll be more information about how to pick up a wreath so that you can do this together as a family or as a couple or as an individual um, on November 29th. Now, I am recording this on Friday, and we still do not know who um, the next president of the United States will be. And I know that a lot of us are uh, feeling uh, tension and anxiety and are just uh, waiting with bated breath for the news to come in. Um, and one of the things that's become obvious to us is that our nation is deeply divided and not just about who should be the next president, but also about issues of um, value of humans and uh, social justice issues. And so I just think that there's such a division and such a tension right now. So as we uh, begin our worship service together, I invite you to join me in prayer. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, as we sit in tension and anxiety and uncertainty, we just pray that your wisdom will pour out on us that we may feel your peace and your comfort and your presence, and that we may know that you are working even though we do not see you or we cannot hear you. For you remind us that time after time, you are here with us and that you work despite us. So may your presence be ever felt and may justice roll down like a mighty river through the rocks and the streams as you erode away the issues in this country. Be with us, O oh God grant us your peace and help us to love one another as you have loved each of us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So I've been thinking a lot about Jeremy Baramy lately, which is another way of saying that I've been thinking about time and how time works. So if you're unfamiliar with Jeremy Baramy, it comes from an episode of The Good Place. And in this episode, Michael, who's the architect of The Good Place, really The Bad Place, which is not much of a spoiler, he is explaining how um, they could live hundreds of lives in the afterlife um, while it's like the day after everybody has died on Earth. And it kind of just blows their mind because they can't understand it. And so he goes over to a poster and he flips it over and he draws a straight line. And on the straight line, he draws some hash marks down the line. And he's like, you know, this is like the timeline of time that you experience on Earth. And like this is, these are events that take place. And so it's chronological, right? It's like, but in the afterlife, time works like Jeremy Baramy. And so he goes over to the board and he draws the name Jeremy Baramy in cursive and he dots the I. And this blows their minds. They're like, wait, so an event can take place before an event that took place after it took place. And they're like, wait, I don't understand it all. And then Chidi wants to know about the dot on the eye. And Michael's like, well, the dot in the eye is Tuesdays in July and when nothing never happens. Um, and so they're just like, wow. Um, and so the interesting thing about Jeremy Baramy is that it actually is a really good way of understanding um, theologically how we talk about time. So like I like to talk about uh, time as like a, a, imagine a box of spaghetti. So if you open the box of spaghetti and you put it on the counter and you look at all of the straight noodles, um, like each noodle is like our life. And so you can like, you know, just take your finger and like touch a point and that's like a point in your life and it's a straight uh, linear uh, way of understanding time and we call that chronos time. Well, for God, God understands time in a different way. And so if you take that same box of spaghetti and you uh, cook it up and you strain it and you put it in a bowl and you take your hand and you draw across a line of spaghetti, the line is no longer straight. The line is all loopy and it's in circles. And so you dissect multiple times all at the same time. Um, and so like, you know, it, like it says in Second Peter 3, 8, that uh, 
a day on earth is like a thousand years to God. And so it's in this way because God doesn't see time or experience time in a chronological fashion that God can see today and yesterday and tomorrow um, all at the same time that God sees the beginning of creation and the end of time. Um, it's a completely different way of seeing time. And I've been thinking about time because it seems like we're in like just this kind of blur of time right now where days kind of blur into each other and yet they seem like they're no time but they take forever and like time's not passing but yet it is and and I wonder maybe just maybe if we're at this kind of special liminal place um, where God and God's time is very close to us and it's at hand and when I start to think about time, there's this verse um, from the book of Esther that always stands out, and it's Esther 4.14. And in this verse, um, Mordecai goes to Esther and says, you know, that like you have been placed in this position of royal dignity for such a time as this. And this is like one of those phrases that like you see like written on t-shirts and it's like painted on billboards and it's like a rally cry at revolutions that like for such a time as this that you were made, you know, to be this vocal voice and to stand up and to, you know, fight for what's right. But I think it's important that we think about this um, understanding as for such a time as this in its original context before we apply it to what it means for us to today. So let's kind of look at the book of Esther and find this particular passage in the place where it takes place um, and then see um, how it can maybe help us in these uh, times that we are living in, this such a time as this. Okay. So the book of Esther takes place about 100 years after the Babylonian exile has ended. And you remember a portion of the Jews returned to Jerusalem and it was a small portion. You know, Ezra and Nehemiah went with them and they, you know, rebuilt the wall and they rebuilt the sanctuary. Um, but a large group stayed behind in the capital city of Susa, which is now the Persian capital. Um, and they had a large Jewish community there. Okay, so the book begins with the king of Persia having this massive half-year kager banquet fest. Um, and at the end of the 187 days of this banquet, he calls for his wife, Queen Vashti, to come out and to entertain his guests. Well, Vashti has zero interest in uh, like revealing herself and stripping for these drunken politician friends of the king. And so she's like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take a hard pass. And so the king's like, well, off with you. And so he uh, vanishes her, um, puts her in exile. And he's like, well, I need a new queen now. So I guess that I'll just have a beauty contest. Um, and so Mordecai uh, encourages his cousin Esther to enter this beauty contest. And she does, and she wins. Um, but she never at any point in the story reveals that she is a Jew. Um, and the king becomes like, fascinated, almost obsessed with her. So the story goes on and he has another one of his banquets, which is something that happens like throughout the story constantly. He has a banquet and um, at the end of this banquet, Mordecai is leaving and he overhears this um, assassination plot against the king. And so he tells Esther and Esther tells the king and the king's like, yay, Mordecai is awesome. He is the hero that we didn't know we needed. Um, and uh, Haman, who is the king's right-hand man, who is also a bad guy. And so if you hear the story read in a synagogue, they often will like ring a bell and it's like boos and hisses when his name is read. Um, he gets jealous of Mordecai. And so when the king is in the next drunken stupor, he goes to the king and he gets the king um, to decree that everybody has to bow down before Haman, especially the Jews. Well, Mordecai is not going to do this. He's got zero interest in doing it. And so the next time that Haman sees Mordecai, Mordecai's like, yet yeah, no, not going to happen. And so this infuriates Mordecai and he like comes up with this plot and he's going to have this giant stake made and he's going to have Mordecai killed on this stake, right? Um, and so they, uh, this decree is made and he doesn't bow down and like, you know, we move on to like uh, more banquets and more time passes. Um, and uh, Haman gets more and more jealous and so he goes to the king when he's in another drunken state and he gets the king to decree that on a particular day that it's going to be okay for everybody just to kill the Jews. Um, and so the king's like, oh, yeah, this is a great idea. Just cast some lots and pick out what that special date is going to be. And so he does. And it's 11 months from the time the decree goes out. 
And so the clock starts to tick for the Jews that live um, in Susa and all the Persian Empire. And at this point, Mordecai goes to Esther and he tells her, he's like, you know what, like, you have to do something. Like, he is obsessed with you. Use that power. You know, use this place of royal dignity for such a time as this or somebody else is going to save the Jews. And so she's like, you know, I, I'm risking my life to do this because nobody can, like, go before the king without the king summonsing them. Um, and he could kill me for doing that. And eventually she kind of like, you know, hems and haws, and she's like, well, if I perish, I perish. So she um, throws a banquet, and she invites the king, and she says, this is just for you. And so the king comes and, like, you know, gets drunk, and, and she's like, uh, yeah, why don't you come back tomorrow? I have something special to reveal to you. And so the king goes back to his chambers, and he's trying to fall asleep, and he can't fall asleep. And so um, he has one of his servants read to him from the like annals of the king or, you know, some kind of like story of all the things that he has done. And as the, the servant is reading to him, he hears the story about how Mordecai saved his life. And he's like, oh, you know what? I totally forgot about that. And I totally owe Mordecai. Um, and so he's like, I'm going to like honor him greatly and so the next day shows up and they're at the banquet and the king is drinking and Esther is like hey uh, BT dubs I'm a Jew and the king is like hey I need to honor Mordecai and so he tells Haman I want you to put Mordecai on a horse and parade him through town and like he's the hero that we've all been needing that you know we've been holding out for um, and so and then Esther's like, hey, but you remember you had that decree where you were going to kill us all? And I know you can't like undecree a decree, but can you do another decree and maybe we can fight back? So the day that, um, that they're supposed to go and kill all the Jews comes and the Jews instead, they kill all their enemies and all the people who are going to kill them, including Haman. And Haman is put up on the stake that he had meant for Mordecai. And then like they um, live happily ever after. And that's like this story of Esther. And there's some really interesting things about this book of Esther that I think are really important for us. Um, first, there's this like huge moral ambiguity. You see all these stories of like drunkenness and um, sex and, and anger and murder and like plots to kill each other. And they're not just done by like who you consider to be the villains in this story. Like even the good guys in this story are plotting to, to do these things. And so there's not like this like clear cut good guy, bad guy based on behavior kind of thing going on in this story. The second thing that's interesting about this story is that you see that like the Jews that are in the story are constantly breaking the Torah commandments. Um, they are marrying Gentiles. They are um, engaging in um, like by e eating unclean food. You know, they're just like doing things that good Jews are not supposed to be doing. But the most prominent thing that's about this book that's interesting is that God is never referenced even once. Um, you know, so we have this story where we're put forth these heroes and it's not clear, um, like it was clear that they're not like the moral examples we're supposed to have, but they're the examples of faith we're supposed to have because even in this like a complete mess of a life, um, they are able to remain hope and have trust in God that God's gonna work. Um, and that even though the people have failed and have had these moral uh, failings, and even though they're in exile, and even though life is a mess around them, God is still present and God is still working. And that's like the point of the book, right? That even when the world around you is a complete mess, that God is still present in that mess and that God is still working on a way when there seems to be no way. And so when we look around like what we're experiencing and what we see on the news now, and it feels like we are in such a mess because you know, what we see here is like people we love whose uh, rights are being threatened, where people with power wish that uh, people didn't even exist, where voices are being squashed, where votes are being suppressed, where people be are being run off the road, um, where it seems like hope is the thing that we are so desperate for and it's so hard to trust. And we just look around and all we see is a complete mess. We are reminded that in such a time as this, that God is still working that God works through every day, ordinary people who are going about their lives 
And when the moment comes for them to have the opportunity to speak up or to speak out, they do it. They take that opportunity. And God is still working around us, even despite us. God is still making a way where there seems no way. Um, and it's hard for us to trust in this. It's hard for us to trust in the goodness of God and the presence of God when we don't see it and we don't hear it and it's hard for us to feel it. It's hard for us to trust when we're not seeing God's presence, when we're not seeing miracles, where, where we are just left wondering, where are you, God? But Esther reminds us that when the world is such a mess, that God is still working on us, and that God is still working through us, and that God is still present with us. And so when we look around and we see the messiness and we see the anger and the fear um, and the desperation and, and we look around and we just feel this great mince of, an, of, a, of like, where are you, God? Let us remember that God has the full picture. He's got the Jeremy bear me right in front of the divine eyes. And because God can see it all, we can trust God. We can believe that God is present with us, even in such a time as this. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, we are so thankful for your presence with us here now and always. We are thankful that you understand things in ways that we could never comprehend. So help us to have the faith to trust in you to trust that you are with us, that you are working and in the messiness of life around us. Even when we have failed to be obedient and failed to live as you have called us to live, that you can still use us to bring your will and your kingdom here and now. Help us, O oh God, that we may be more faithful and that we may answer the call when you call us in such a time as this. May you continue to lift us and hold us and love us. And may you continue to pick us up when we fall. For in you we move and, and find our ever being. In your holy name we pray. Amen. i
Good morning. Did you guys know that God gives us courage when we are doing hard things? Courage that we don't know if we otherwise would have had? It's true. God does that for us. Have y'all ever heard the story of Queen Esther? Well, she's amazing, and Pastor Tara is preaching about her today. See, Queen Esther was a Jewish queen who was married to the king of Persia, but he didn't know that she was Jewish. And at one point during their marriage, he decided that he was gonna do very hurtful things to the Jewish people. Her uncle, Mordecai, took her aside and said, Esther, you need to go to your husband, the king, and tell him not to hurt our people. And she didn't know if she could do it. And he said, Esther, maybe you were made for a time such as this. And sure enough, she went to the king and she told the king that she was Jewish and that he should not hurt the Jewish people. And he did not. Because Queen Esther believed in God, God gave her the courage to do that really hard thing. And when we have faith in God, God will do the same thing for us. God will make us stronger and give us courage when we need to do really hard things. We do hard things all the time. Maybe you see someone being treated unfairly and you wanna speak up on their behalf. God can give you the courage to do that. Or maybe you get really nervous before you perform or play a sport. God can give you the courage to get over that fear so that you can go do what it is you need to do. So let's go to God right now and give thanks for this in prayer. Gracious God, thank you for the story of Esther who believed in you and had enough faith that you would give her the courage to do the really hard thing. We know that you love us and that you too will give us courage when we need it. We love you and we'll talk to you real soon. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And now may you go in the peace and grace of Christ. May you see God moving around you and through you and perhaps even despite you. And may the peace of Christ send you forth into the world to bring peace and love and hope until we see each other again. In Christ's holy name, go forth.